Welcome to a short video overview of the Resuscitation Council's 2015 guidelines. I'm Dr. David Pitcher, one of the authors of the guidelines on prevention of cardiac arrest and making decisions about CPR. I'm going to focus on the changes and changes of emphasis from the previous guidelines in each of the two main elements of this chapter. In the previous guidelines, recommendations on prevention of cardiac arrest focused only on actions to prevent cardiac arrest in hospital. There are no major changes in the recommended approach to this. Early recognition of deterioration is crucial and can be achieved best by the widespread use of an early warning score. In the UK, the National Early Warning Score, or NEWS, is the one that's recommended. A prompt and effective response to deterioration is also crucial. And the guidelines emphasise the important roles that outreach teams and medical emergency teams can play in delivering that response. Far more cardiac arrests occur out of hospital than in hospitals. So the 2015 guidelines mention also the measures needed to try to prevent some out of hospital cardiac arrests. Many of these are due to acute coronary syndromes. These need early recognition and a prompt call for help. A coordinated system of emergency medical response should be available at all times to make sure that those who need it have direct access to primary percutaneous coronary intervention without delay. Not all out-of-hospital cardiac arrests are due to acute coronary syndromes. It's important that you recognise and respond appropriately to symptoms such as unexplained syncope, which may be the only warning of a condition placing a person at risk of sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. The second part of the chapter focuses on making anticipatory decisions about CPR. It emphasises that when a person is at risk of dying or suffering cardiac arrest, making a decision in advance about whether or not to attempt CPR is an integral part of good quality clinical care. There should be a presumption in favour of involving the patient in that process unless to do so would be impossible or would cause them harm. Where CPR wouldn't work because the person is dying from an advanced and irreversible condition, their involvement will be to have the decision and the reason why it's needed explained to them in a sensitive way. Where there's a possibility that CPR could offer a chance of success that the patient would consider worthwhile, the decision on whether or not to attempt it should be a shared decision. When you consider making a decision about whether or not to attempt CPR, if you fail to involve the patient and consider their wishes, you may be acting in breach of their human rights. Remember that this is likely to apply even if you decide that CPR will be attempted, as that may not be what they would have chosen. The guidelines describe also the actions needed when a patient lacks capacity to contribute to decisions about CPR, the involvement of those close to the patient and the importance of clear and full documentation and of effective communication. Anticipatory decisions about CPR are usually best made in the broader context of decisions about other choices of care and treatment towards the end of life. The patient must be central to all these aspects of decision making. In summary, the priorities for preventing cardiac arrest remain the early recognition of situations and conditions that predispose to cardiac arrest and delivery of prompt and effective responses to them. Anticipatory decisions about CPR are part of good quality care and must be made using a process that is both lawful and ethical. The full Resuscitation 2015 guidelines can be found on the Resuscitation Council UK's website, along with video summaries of all other sections.